so today uh, I will be talking about a composition model that springs from a socio-musical imagination, a term that comes from sociological imagination, meaning to read things through a web of social connections, highlighting relational ontological positions. And the interest came from my curiosity to attend otherness and to cultivate practices of listening and responding through network of relations within social sound engagements. So the somewhat uh, provocative title of this talk, Electro Music Composition pra Process as a Process of Com hyphen Position, has something to do with highlighting these relations. So the word composition, as you can see here, comes from the Latin componere, and the prefix com has an, is an archaic version of the con in Latin, meaning in combination, together, uh, with. And ponere means to position and to place. So composition then means to put together, to collect and make a whole from several different parts. And so I use the word with the hyphen in order to symbolize and contextualize sociosonic acts that emerge from within a multivalent network of connections between several agents as well as several acts in the composition process, that is. Um, and here the model focuses on interfaces of connection from the composer's point of view. So in today's talk, I'll follow a trajectory of starting with general concepts um, that inform the model and then get more specific as I go uh, to provide further perspective and examples. So let's start with the concept of multivalence that shapes the understanding of working with the several, the plural. And I'll put a blank page for rest here. So multivalence, uh, by definition, is a system that is capable of having more than one value, application, meaning, and or interpretation. Therefore, in a multivalent space, the existence of dissimilarities is a sine qua non, it's a must have. And it's generally assumed that difference paves way for uh, separatism, suggesting power relationships of the I and the other insider outsider, which are positions that are based on binary categorizations. But in order to set up a multivalent space, there is the need to establish a logic of the end rather than an either or one. And this doesn't get the, this doesn't mean to get rid of the binary, but it's about including it to form an expanded understanding um, of this uh, of the space. So here there's an interest in recognizing and overthrowing fantasies of one way control systems of top down hierarchies and to open up a space of heterarchical relational habitats where power moves and shifts either singular or at times shared in multiple, but always in flux. So within such sociosonic milieu, with the acts arise a series of resistances and accommodations on multiple ends. Therefore, the skill of having the ability to respond to and with the other really depends on highly attending, uh, noticing, uh, caring, and the fragile negotiation of balances, which makes it a very messy and lively act. So this understanding of multivalence then carried within the music practices and specifically into the understanding of the role of the composer suggests a move away from the conventional essentialist and centralized understanding of composerhood that stems back to 19th century eurogenetic uh, romantic heritage and into practices of uh, decentering where the composer is not described as someone who is in command of from a hierarchical perspective, but as one actor within a network of entangled relations with other agents and acts. And this decentered non-essentialist perspectives are growing day by day today as one of the prominent characteristics of 21st century music practices is the interest in the transformation of roles of composers, uh, interpreters, instruments and audiences. So from here, in order to further contextualize the posture of the composer in the model, let's visit two more terms and then go into the more tangible practice domain. Uh, the first two term we'll visit is a responsibility. Uh, put briefly, responsibility is the ability and or capacity of oneself to respond to others. Uh, within the model, the term responsibility follows paths introduced by Karen Barrett, who is a theoretical physicist and feminist theorist, and Donna Haraway is a scientist, philosopher, and a feminist scholar. Uh, both Barrett and Haraway's understanding of the production of knowledge is always read under the relational, and their understanding of responsibility is about holding full accountability of one's own thoughts and actions, knowing that they have consequences for others. So this understanding of responsibility surfaces as key in the practice of the model uh, by recognizing that there's a consequence of our music practice that shapes the common record. It's interested in going visiting, inviting a variety of agents, 
building a response practice on cultivating acts of attention, noticing care through a heightened form of listening, and then tracing and expressing one's own process of composing with others as explicitly as one can, and making these maps, these cartographies available for others to trace and process themselves, which will open up uh, further uh, spaces for negotiation. And the other and final term concept that I'll introduce is what Donna Haraway calls politeness in engaging with others in what she calls polite inquiry. And the politeness Haraway talks about is not about manners, but rather an epistemological posture. A polite practice rejects perspectives of objectification, where the listener, the gazer, the doer projects and imposes one's own desires and fantasies onto the listened, the gaze, which gazed. Uh, which assigns hierarchical relations and more importantly static active passive roles to agents. So we can say that polite practice holds a dissonance with the primal reflex to domesticate, to control the unfamiliar, the other, and to the point of familiarization. So this means that this entails uh, inviting levels of unknown into the relational process where one does not easily jump into simplistic definitions. Um, so becoming a polite inquirer then is about attending to the other in a practice that's interested to give, to bring forward, to render capable, to let be, to enable, rather than to tame, control, and manipulate. So it's about becoming a responder and a facilitator for things to come up from within relations that emerge in multivalent sonic habitats. So from this place, we can begin to ask, so how may such a posture bring about a practice for composing in a musical context? And of course, there is an endless sea of possibilities to think with sound through such approach. Uh, here, let's go ahead and look into one strand that I explore in my own practice, where my model, um, the, the, the model, the practice in my model sub deliberately subverts simple processes. So by introducing unconventional, experimental, generative and multivalent strategies, it opens up a plane for the composer to empty out various prescriptive and habitual ways to think and respond, which lead to experimenting and investigating forms of responsible uh, sonic acts. So for this, I focus on two main categories of relations uh, in the practice. Uh, one is relations and engagement processes with others, and second is relations between the results of modes of production realized in the stages of the composition process, which include oral analysis, performance, and evaluation. So let's go ahead and look into these processes a little bit more closer, starting with introducing the, uh, who the other is in my uh, practice. Um, so within the scope of uh, this talk, I narrow down the other to more than human agents and specifically to agents within fixed sound recordings, so acousmatic agents, which could include a wide variety of living and non-living entities, ranging from animal, plant, environment sounds, uh, and objects, that is, physical material objects, which could range from conventional musical instruments to non-conventional ones, including everyday objects, found objects, etc. I highlight these two categories of agents to trace an engagement process that di diverges out of the historically conventional understanding of composerhood uh, in the historiography of the bulk of our electroacoustic music discourses, aside from soundscape studies and some other occasional mentions within the engagement process, these two types of agents are particularly described as passive, inert and static things that are to be controlled and manipulated. And so the model proposed here proposed, uh, moves out of this understanding of treating um, physical objects as well as recorded sound as things that are passive, but through some unconventional and experimental means proposed to take them in hand as agential forces and see what that does to the practice. So let's begin unpacking these two categories of agents and relations with them, starting with acousmatic agents. Um, we know that we very well that recordings situate agents. Once the recording it is made, it cuts, it fragments, it re-territorializes, and it expresses partial information about the agents, which are tied to body, space, uh, time, and situation. So the immediate question that arises is then, how is the self to interact with such agencies that reside within fixed sound recordings, hence they cannot respond back, what type of relational positions are possible here? And so the particular strand of the model I introduce here today is based on contemplative response practice and explores levels of engagement through learning, acceptance, and 
uh, ability to relate to a world without me, so without the self, and asking the question, how may the self join in as a polite inquirer and trace the effects of this joining in on oneself, the other, and the relation. Uh, with the second category of agents, exploring relations with material agents, objects and instruments, I invite embodied means of relational strategies with other, uh, with the other through acts of performance, uh, one that thinks with tactile and motion based form of relations. So let's uh, move into the stages of the composition practice in order to explore the how of the relations with these agents. Uh, the stages of the practice entail oral analysis response, performance response, which is given with moving and touching body, and finally, re-evaluation response, which reads different results from within one another and further generates responses. So switching between modalities of oral response and motion-based tactile responses create a feedback loop of thinking through doing, doing through thinking, where abstract concepts are brought to life sonically. Uh, the goal is really to generate a series of leakages and ruptures uh, that occur in the translation process, which are valuable tools to disorient uh, and decenter a uh, fixed uh, and authoritarian singular composer posture. So in engaging with the sound recordings, the first encounter is with the oral analysis process. Uh, this process is interested in what is heard, so not extracting data that could not be perceived by the ear. In other words, it's interested in an embodied understanding of analysis, constantly asking, what do I hear? How do I listen? How can I listen differently? What happens when I do so, etc. So the analysis is um, not about critiquing, at least not in the mainstream manner, but about moving beyond one's own likes and dislikes and is interested in visiting the other and tracing the effects of this visit on oneself and then offering that. So in developing capacities to work with a wide variety of agents within sound recordings that have a wide variety of sound types and behaviors, on top of that sounding within different musical contexts, we need musical tools that enable us to do so. Um, let's go ahead and look at some tools that I use within my practice. So I take in hand a sound based approach, which provides equal ground to various sound types that are more than solely pitch based structures, so it's inclusive and implements spectrum morphological descriptions of these sounds, which afford to describe sound based uh, sounds and is used with oral perception where individual follow follows interaction between sound spectra and the way it changes through time, tracing one's own listening memory and attention. So both the sound based approach and the spectromorphological descriptions, the terminology is used because they allow to connect with a wide range of sound types, sources, context within a common ground, and therefore provide a general level of coherency within the engagement process. Along with these, um, my practice focuses on listening to movement, tracing energy trajectories and motion to help guide the relational experience. And for this, I use a temporal semiotic units um, that was um, developed in uh, the Music and Informatics Laboratory of Marseille, France in 1992. Uh, there are 19 uh, units. Let me give an example over here while I'm talking. Um, so they express a basic information about the unit, uh, then some morphological descriptions along with some semantic meanings. So these units are used as the main apparatus in the model as they provide a fruitful plane for embodied reading, as well as to function to frame and limit contact zones between differences. So these units direct intentionality, accompany listening, and afford to explore a sense of shared action, what I like to call motion companionship, uh, which opens up possibilities for entrainment, empathy, and therefore rendering possible a response able composing. So from both the analysis and perspe performance perspective, the apparatuses function as companions in supporting the listening experience of, of the self. And here a cartographic study begins, uh, the self tries and makes uh, one own thought and engagement patterns as explicit as one can, which results in uh, sketches, uh, transcriptions, graphics, words, uh, and eventually um, into turns into an analysis video. Um, after this is done, the next phase is about exploring the hunches of the body together and against what the listening had produced. So it moves into the um, tactile and motion-based responses. 
uh, as we know, thoughts are somewhat inscribed within the body and bodies think differently and express differently. And so here the thought process of moving and touching bodies are invited into the composition process. So up to this stage in the model, the self responds to the sound recording by listening. And in this stage, material agents, objects, instruments are invited to participate, populating the assemblage of agents uh, in the practice. And here I adopt and adapt uh, a practice of Guy Rebel, which he taught in his electroacoustic composition classes called Sequence du Jeu, uh, play sequence. In his play sequence, um, by means of a performer, a sounding object body and a microphone, the composer explores various gestures of sounding capabilities of the object and of course one's own capabilities. And the goal of Rebel was to introduce intentionality and and to link gestural and bodily listening within electroacoustic composition, which was actually later picked up by Annette van de Gorn and developed, uh, created, she created what she calls gestural archetypes, which is also a very interesting work. So I would suggest you to take a look if you are interested. Um, so within the model I present here, play sequence is uprooted from its initial mode of practice and carried within new materialist thought inviting an unconventional view into music practice. Now, there are various forms of new materialist practices. In my research, I follow feminist new materialist thinkers, specifically Karen Barrett's understanding where performativity of the agency lies at the heart of the practice. In new materialism, material objects are understood as agents that are participatory things uh, that carry potential to cause changes in our actions and engagement with them. So I ask, uh, what may material agency do to the composition practice? What type of consequences uh, may it produce? An immediate answer is that recognizing agency and object changes one view of uh, material from an inert to, do, to a dynamic one, which makes possible an instrument-human collaboration where the instrument may equally play the human. So in a way, it allows a fresh look into questioning how do objects shape one's ideas and movements. So in, in doing this, I work with indeterminate characteristics with instruments, exploring relations and responses that emerge from contingencies and explore multiple notions of playing with, which includes playing on, playing to, playing in, playing by, being played by, etc. And, and this allows the self to end up with an expanded understanding of material, material that is physical, that is a sonic thing, and that is performative. So material agency works through speculative thought in guiding the practice and it overthrows conventional habitual human experience. Uh, today, the new materialist understanding of objects and instruments uh, within the field of musical practices are also uh, emerging in rich fields. Today, uh, Dylan uh, Bouchet earlier today introduced a series of agential approaches with objects under his repurposed items, a very stimulating and inspiring talk as well. Um, so coming back to the stages of the practice, the self then plays with these objects and instruments in real time dialogue in response to the fixed sound recording. And in doing this, the model proposes working with a, sim a seemingly, you know, contradictory yet simple uh, process to guide and trace one's own responses, uh, similarity and difference responses. So similarity response in my practice is connected to empathetic thinking, working through mimicking the other. However, it's not about direct mimesis, wearing the other like a costume, aiming to represent the other, but in a more generative approach that's interested in exploring what might becoming the other be like. So there's a level of story in here. The difference response, on the other hand, is about highlighting different difference. It opposes, contrasts, diverges from the other in terms of sound types, behavior, context, etc. Without being disruptive and destructive to the other, it aims to figure differential forms of coexisting within the sound um, space. So the result of working with two contrasting perspectives is about looking at how one's own responses change and in which ways coming back to the idea of including binaries, binarisms, and movements between them. So which positions the composer in a plane of constant movement and flux functioning to disorient and decenter a fixed and singular uh, composer stance. So after these responses are given, finally, the self moves into a generative reevaluation response. 
Um, and here, the, in the reassessment stage, the composing self moves to a third person view, re editing, re evaluating the analysis and performance material, and listening back with com contemplation, giving further responses in the act of composing, which keeps on generating responses. So, through the practice, the process is not sequential, but it's consequential. So, one can go back and change previous decisions, actions, sounds, and uh, responses in a way. Um, so, and by doing so, of course, the aim is to move out of the linear as well as top down thinking doing and create complex modulations between the relational processes. And here, although the generative and multivalent process is what drives the practice, with the evaluation process, distilled works emerge, which are composed versions of the similarity and the difference responses together with the acousmatic agent. Um, so let's finally briefly look into the ontology of the results here. The resulting compositions are meaningful musical entities in and of themselves, therefore it could be presented as they are without any context. However, in this situation, the process where connections and relations are made are most probably not apparent on the surface of the audible level. And secondly, in order to make the process available for others, providing context and further information regarding the thought and act, uh, processes, there is the possibility of presenting the process as the work itself, which meaning means to uh, present the sketches, uh, the sound recordings, the notes, the analysis videos, etc. And by making the process available for the others, the goal is to open up a further negotiation. So within this context, then, the whole process becomes a series of enacting, differentiating, and entangling, generating and situating, basically dealing with a paradox. And by disrupting itself through a system and a process, it aims to disrupt the conventional and habitual uh, ways for processes that lead to and lead into new ways of relational thinking, listening, enacting, um, as well as a mesh of uh, multivalent possibilities ready for renegotiation. So in closing, uh, although there's still much to explore and refine in the model, um, informed by this socio-musical imagination, I believe the epistemological postures offer engaged practices for learning to live and negotiate in a world of multiplicity and difference, and offer practices that are about noticing, giving attention, and offering, which have potential to cultivate aware, caring, and thoughtful uh, processes for our sound practices and hopefully our uh, common record.